Good morning. Good morning. It is so great to see so many wonderful eyes looking this way. I, I, I assume you're all smiling. I can't really tell, but that's, that's the signs of the times, right? But it is so good to be together as the, as the family of God. I uh, want to just mention a few things as we gather this morning. First of all, we are in week two of our 8 o'clock service. And so if you find it a little tight, uh, you know, not, not quite as much room for social distancing here as you would prefer, or if you're at home and would like to come and join us, there is lots of room at 8 o'clock. I don't know why, but there's lots of room at 8 o'clock. So we would love to have you consider, especially if you're at home and um, wanting to make sure that there's plenty of space to spread out and be socially distanced. We got you covered at 8 o'clock. We'd love to have you. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention to you, you'll see it on the screens here in just a few moments, but today at 3 o'clock, we have our first in our, our 2021 concert series. And um, today we're going to feature Ben Ball and Brian Eggert. Brian plays a PhD in trumpet and just um, phenomenal musicians both. But more than anything, they love the Lord they love the Lord individually and collectively, and so it will be a chance to, to hear not only some great classical repertoire, but some hymns treated very reverently, very respectfully, very well, and very triumphantly. So um, today at 3 o'clock, we'd love to have you come back and bring a friend. Um, maybe some folks that you've been saying, you've got to hear the music at our church. What a great opportunity. We would love to have them come as well. The uh, second thing that I want to mention to you is that beginning Wednesday night, this Wednesday night at 6.30, we've got all kinds of programming going on over in the education room building, and we've also got uh, an adult Bible study here. But this week, we're going to be starting a new series, the Connections class. Now, the Connections class is a six-week time to get to know more about Hope, New Hope Church and more of the staff. I'll be there if you want to get to know me a little bit better. I can't imagine why you would want to do that, but if you want to, it's available to you. Now, what happens is if you want to become a full member of New Hope Church, you need to go through Connections. It's like I said, it's a chance for you to get to know about us and us you and all that kind of stuff. But the other side is if you just want to know more about us, um, you don't have to join when it's over. But if you want to join, you have to. So there's a syllogism going on there. Everyone, so anyway, we, we'll, we'll leave that alone. But we would love to have you Wednesday night at 6.30 over in the education building. Uh, another thing that I'd like to mention to you this morning, um, there are a lot of folks that have gotten the inoculation. Praise God for that. There are a lot of folks, even in our church family, who still need the inoculation. Now, if you've gotten the inoculation, you know it's a very arduous process to even get an invitation for the inoculation. We are recruiting some folks. Kathy Orr. Kathy, would you mind standing so everyone can know who you are? Kathy is one of our elders, and she has a heart for ministry, and she saw a need that we feel like we might be able to meet. For those that are shut-ins, for those of you at home, who are technologically challenged or just time challenged, don't have the time to be able to sit on the phone and keep hitting redial until you get in to get your shot. We want to create a team of helpers for those folks. And so the client, if you will, will be the person at home or here in the room that just has not been able to get through to get their shot. The helping team will be folks of us, volunteers coordinated by Kathy, to get on the phone and get on the technology and get a spot for that person who needs an inoculation. And so if you would like to be a part of that volunteer team helping out in a very, very important and valuable way, um, please see Kathy. She'll be out in the lobby afterward. She'll give you more details. She'll get your email. We'll set this thing up. Time is really of the essence because especially the most vulnerable need to get these shots. And so we want to try to get this going as well and as soon as possible. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you'll turn your attention to the screens, we'll give you a brief announcement video. And then Ben will lead us in our prelude as we forget what goes on outside and focus on the Lord. Good morning and welcome to worship at New Hope Presbyterian. We're glad to have you. This afternoon at 3 p.m. is our first concert of 2021. It will feature our own organist, Ben Ball, along with Dr. Brian Edgett, accompanying him on trumpet. 
This is a fabulous and free opportunity. Feel free to go ahead and invite your friends as we gather at 3 p.m. this afternoon for this wonderful event. I also want to remind you whether you've been attending online or here on campus for years or just weeks, we'd love to see you Wednesday night at our Connections class at 630. This class is part of our path to membership and can answer any questions you have about New Hope as we get to share the story of how we got here with you. If you're worshiping online or at home, there are four unique ways for you to give to God's kingdom. Number one, you can text to give. Number two, you can give online. Number three, you are welcome to mail a paper check to the address you see on your screen. Or number four, if you're worshiping on campus, go ahead and drop it in one of those white boxes as you exit the lobby today. If you're also part of our New Hope family, which is everyone watching, we'd love for you to sign in on our virtual friendship pad. Go to our website, click the contact tab, and you'll see the friendship pad drop down from there. You can share prayer requests with us and let us know that you are part of our New Hope family, whether you're here in the building or at home. We're ready to begin this week's service as Pastor Mike brings us another message in the series, New Year, Old You. Come, let us worship together. Hear the call to worship. To the one to whom all creation sings, let them praise the Lord. Shout their holy confession with new songs, resounding in heaven and earth and among the captives of Zion. Let those who will be judged wicked in the end also resound in diverse spiritual songs, so that all who have breath may praise Christ together through all ages who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Please stand as we sing together, praise the Lord, the Almighty.
praise you. We worship you today and sing the love amazing that songs cannot repay. For we can only wonder at every gift you send, at blessings without number and mercies without end. We lift our hearts before you and wait upon your word. We love and adore you, our great and mighty Lord. O oh, gracious Father, come be with us this morning as we worship and honor and glorify your name. Fill our hearts by your spirit that we might serve and honor you with our offerings that we bring. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. join in the response of reading from Psalm 118. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. My soul is on those who It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does salvation. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has visited me spirit, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and be the to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our lives. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you.
Hear the call to confession in Matthew chapter 11. Jesus said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let's pray together. O oh, gracious and loving God, you have blessed us with blessings beyond measure. You have blessed us with the love of your Son, who while we were yet sinners, died for us. Father, we come now boldly to the throne of grace to seek your favor, to ask for forgiveness. Lord, we come now to confess our sins, and we ask, Father, that you will be gracious to us according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion that you will blot out our transgressions, wash us thoroughly of our iniquities, and cleanse us of our sins. For we know our sins. We know that we have transgressed your law. We know, Father, that we have turned from you. Father, as we come back to you, we know that it is against you and you only that we have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. So, Father, purify us with hyssop and wash us that we may be whiter than snow. Hide your face from our iniquities and blot out our transgressions and create in us a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Father, we come now humbly beseeching you. We come now in the quiet of this moment, confessing our sins. Lord, give us a heart to repent and to turn, to come back to you. O oh, gracious and loving Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for being ever ready to care for us, to love us, but most important, to forgive us. We praise and rejoice in your word that says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Father, with joyful hearts, we come now to sing that prayer that you taught your disciples as we join together to sing.
assurance of salvation from Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let us stand and praise the Lord with the doxology. faith together responsibly. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no other God and there never was another. From him is all beginning. He upholds all things. And his son Before the beginning of the world, he was present with the Father. By him all things, both visible and invisible, were made. And the Father has bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. He will render to everyone according to his deeds and has poured out abundantly on us the gift of the Holy Spirit and even the pledge of immortality, who makes those that believe and obey to be the sons of God, the Father, and joint heirs with Christ. Please stand as we sing our hymn of preparation. Lord, speak to me that I may speak.
Let's continue to worship as we join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, we have just sung, speak through me. Lord, I confess to you right now that we are a sinful people, that we have, we, as we have confessed to you already this morning and heard the assurance of your pardon, may we never take that lightly. We may, may we never take that for granted. May we never take that as something that was cheaply purchased. It was purchased at the price of your son. And so, God, thank you that we can come to you. You tell us, since we have a great high priest, one who has been tempted in every way, and yet he was without sin, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence in our hour of need. And so, Father, we come to you in confidence, but also recognizing that we are in an hour of need. We need your healing touch, Lord. There are those in our congregation, those on our hearts, that are infirmed today, Father, some in hospitals, some in hospice, some at home. We ask, Father, that you would be the Psalm 103.3 God, the one that we bless because you heal all of our diseases. God, we are also in need of your healing touch on our city, on our county, on our state, on our country, on our world, Lord. As we look around, we see so much strife, so much troubles, and we, we read from your word, what causes strifes among you? You want what you don't have. And what you want, you want for the not, not the right reasons. And so, Father, we pray by your spirit that you would bring peace, not just stop the wars, but bring peace, the kind of shalom peace that we as your people enjoy. Father, make us instruments of your peace. We lift up our leaders to you, Lord. And as we pray so often, Lord, we ask that they would ask you for wisdom. If any man lacks wisdom, he should ask you because you love to give it, but... When we ask, we must be willing to listen because, Lord, you are not an advisor. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are God. And so, Father, we pray as you ask us to pray for those in authority over us. And we ask, Lord, that they would have the humility to seek your face. God, we pray for your church, not just New Hope, but your church throughout the world, those who are missionaries, those who are serving in, in places that, that we don't even know about, in neighborhoods, in communities, in cities and towns and countries, Lord. And we ask that you would build them up by your spirit, that you would encourage them by your spirit, and that we as the body would continue to lift them up and also involve ourselves in ways that you would lead us to. And we thank you, Lord, that we are your children, the sheep of your pasture the people under a loving and watchful God. And so, Father, we lift to you all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So, my first call out of seminary, you may or may not know this, I was a college chaplain. I worked at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. Go moccasins. Any? You know, no one's ever a moccasin. I don't know. The University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, fairly medium-sized school, but um, there were teaching classrooms, as you can well imagine, and, and courses like Psychology 101 and all had huge classrooms with 150, 200 students at a time, and one professor up front in the teaching auditorium. And um, one day th this was happening, the, the professor passed out the little blue books. Remember those from, from back in the days when you actually wrote stuff instead of typed it and Google docked it or whatever? So this was back in the Stone Age when they used the little blue books. And um, he passed them out and he said, you've got exactly 45 minutes to take this test. When I say start, I'll start my timer. When I say stop, you must stop, close your book, Put away your stuff, bring your book, turn it in on my desk. If you write past my deadline, I cannot receive your test. 
So he said, let's go. Everybody open their books. They start writing. Everybody's just working away, 150 students working away together. 45 minutes later, he says, okay, stop. Put away your books. And most of the class put them away. There's this one guy up in the corner, and he's still writing. And the professor said, uh, son, I see you. You need to stop now. And he just keeps on writing. And by this time, the professor's getting frustrated because everybody's coming up and they're putting their books on their desk and on his desk and they're walking on out and he's still up there writing. And finally, about seven minutes after the deadline, he stops, closes up his little book, walks up to the professor and the professor says, I can't receive your book. And the student says, do you know who I am? And the professor says, no, but I cannot receive your book. And he says, you mean to tell me after six months in this class, you don't know who I am? And he says, no, but I cannot receive your book. And he says, you really don't know who I am? And by this time, the professor's thinking, you know, maybe he's like the president's son. Maybe he's like, he's got some power over me here. But he says, um, I don't know who you are, but I can't receive your book. And he said, you're sure you don't know who I am? But I said, no, I really don't. And he said, good. And he shoved his book in the middle of the pile and walked out. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to know who you are. <laughs> and sometimes you need to be able to know who you are so you can tell others who you are. The mission of New Hope Presbyterian Church, we exist to glorify God and make disciples by living out the gospel together. Now, that's a mission statement that a group of folks came together and worked very, very hard for about a year on Friday nights and Saturday morning. They came together as a cross-section of our church and, and identified five values that if you take those away from us, we are no longer us. We are no longer New Hope Presbyterian Church. Those values then percolated to where we came up with the mission statement that we have in front of you here. We're going through a short series on what our values are and what difference that makes, how that defines us, what do we do about them. So far, we've looked at lavish grace. Lavish grace is that God has given us extravagant love and mercy so that we can give it generously to others. Take that away from us, we are no longer New Hope Church. Foundational truth, the Scripture, the unchanging truth of Scripture is our bedrock in this ever-changing world. Transforming growth, we talked about that last week at, at, at how we must be authentic and genuine in our worship so that we can be transformed and continually become more like Christ. Today we're going to look at strategic action. Strategic action, the whole world helping, the whole church helping the whole world experience God's love. Now, if you look on the website, each one of these values has a demonstrable effect. In other words, they are ways that those things lived out are demonstrated. And strategic action is demonstrated by building diverse friendships with people who don't look like us, don't speak like you, don't believe, don't worship, or live as we do. It also means that we're loving our brothers and sisters around the whole world the same way that we would love our next-door neighbors. It means collaborating with other churches, not competing in our community to seek the peace and prosperity of our city. It means supporting and encouraging those who are living and serving cross-culturally. Now, some of the underpinnings for those values, of course, they're found in Scripture. One of those Scriptures in Luke chapter 10 where it talks about the prodigal son, the prodigal, I'm sorry, the Good Samaritan story about how the Good Samaritan gave everything for a stranger. Another place where that's found is in the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the earth. Make disciples. But another place where that's found is in 1 Peter 2, chapter 2. We're going to be looking at excerpts of 1 Peter chapter 2, but we're going to live right here on verse 212. And it says, Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits you. Now, to kind of set the stage for the rest of 1 Peter, especially 1 Peter chapter 2, 
I want to I, I, I share with you something that anthropologists, sociologists, and missiologists all agree on, okay? An anthropologist is someone who studies man being man. A sociologist is someone who studies man with other men in a, in a society. And a missiologist is someone who studies the effect of the church on culture, okay? Anthropologists, sociologists, and missiologists all agree that many times, if not most times, that religions in a culture can go to one polar extreme or the other. On the one polar extreme, they become what they call sectarian. In other words, you have to ascribe and subscribe and behave and act like we do in order to get in. And so they build these tall walls around the church, around the organization, around the club, around the group that says, unless you're just like us, you can't be with us. And so they seclude themselves. They become a sect of the society, and people will walk right by and say, well, who are those folks? I don't know, but they're not me, so I don't really care, right? Well, the other side, the other extreme, the other polar opposite is those that will become so assimilated, so mainstream, and what the sociologists call the parish mentality. In other words, the church or religion or club or organization becomes so accepting that whoever comes by feels completely comfortable there. Somebody once said they become so open-minded that their brain falls out. <laughs> and so as we read 1 Peter, Think reading through it with those two polar extremes. I know we've stood a lot this morning, but let's stand together as we read excerpts of 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's stand in honor of the word. 1 Peter 2. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then in verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now down to verse 22. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So in this passage... We're going to look at three areas. We're going to look at the tension of living between the two extremes, the two polar opposites, between the, the extreme of being a sectarian with high walls and a parish mainstream with no walls. We're going to look at the tension of that. We're going to look at the paradox of that. And then we we're going to look at the power of strategic action in response to that. So let's start with the tension. As we think about it, the sectarian cult or the sectarian folks see the, church, the culture around them as the them. It's the them. We want to keep them out. They can only come in if they're like us. We want to make sure that, that, that they aren't messing with us, that they're not spoiling us. We want to build a big wall of them, and we're on one side, and they're on the other side. And, and the we're is not New Hope, it's not the church, it's the sectarian. It's the people that say, the only way you can get into my club is if you act like me, sound like me, smell like me, worship like me, talk like me, act like me. That's the sectarian. And so they see the rest of the culture around them as the them. But the parish man, mainstream mentality perceived the society as being us. 
we're all in this thing together and we're just sort of going through life together and, and, and so us is them and them is us and everything gets along. Okay, so when you think about this in just a moment, if you think about should we be separate or should we assimilate? Should we be sectarian with tall walls or should we be assimilating with no walls? What should we do? Now, see, what's so interesting is even though these are bipolar opposites, even though they are on two opposite extremes from the way that churches, organizations, religions engage culture, they're both about the same thing. They're both about power. Think about this for a moment. If you are a sectarian and it's all about them, then you control the narrative of the truth, and you say, well, those folks over there, the only way to defeat them is to go after them and attack them. And so they raise up the power so that they can be a part of that. On the other hand, the assimilate team, the mainstream, the parish mentality says, well, if we're just like them, they'll like us, and therefore they'll make us one of their own. It's about power. But interesting, both sides avoid suffering. Think about this. The sectarian avoids suffering by not engaging the suffering. The assimilation, mainstream parish thought, avoids suffering by not being distinct and being, risking any kind of suffering as a, as a result. And so when we think about these two polar opposites, what should we be as the church, as Christ's followers? What should we be? We should be none of the above. We should be none of the above. We, we can't give over everything and just look like everybody else, but we can't be so rigid and sectarian that we keep people out. That's what First Peter is telling us. Look at verse 11. He says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look back and see who, who Peter was writing to when he was writing this letter to the foreigners and the exiles that he just identified there. He is writing to third and fourth generation folks that have lived in the same town for three and four generations. He's writing to Greeks in Greece. He's writing to Romans in Rome. He's writing to Jews. He's writing to folks that were clearly part of the cultural fabric. And yet he says, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Foreigners and exiles. What he means there in the Greek is what he fleshes out when he goes into the next verse here. He says, but you're a chosen people, separate, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, separated. Okay, then it seems like they should be sectarian. It seems like they should build the high wall. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Now, all of a sudden, it sounds like they should be mainstream parish folk, doesn't it? Where is the blend? How does that work? It's in that word foreigners. It's in that word exiles. In another translation, it says you are aliens, but you're not aliens as in weird with like antennas and stuff. You're aliens as in resident aliens. You still live in the culture. You're still part of the culture. You're still walking in the culture, but you're walking in a different kind of light now because of what he has done. You're a holy priesthood. You're a royal house, and yet you're still engaged. Josephus was a, a historian of that day, and he actually, he actually said, those Christians, those Christ followers, they're a different genus, not genius, genus. They're a different species. They're a different kind of people. Because as I look at them and I see their behavior and I see the way that they act and, and the only thing I can find for the reason they act is because they've got this belief in this, in this risen Savior named Jesus. And he outlined a few of the things that, that, that the church did in the first century, that the people who followed Jesus did in the first century that were absolutely countercultural. They didn't go to bloody entertainment. They didn't go to the gladiator games. They didn't engage in that. And what that meant was that they removed themselves from a major conduit of society's relationships because they didn't go to the Colosseum. They were against abortion and infanticide. They believed in the unborn's right, and they believed in rescuing these children who were abandoned by their families in that day because back in that day, if you had a baby and you didn't like the sex of the baby, you just put it out on the street. 
That's where orphanages began. Because Christian families living in the culture, going against the norms of the culture, would go by and scoop up these precious children made in the image of God and bring them into their own house and raise them at their own expense. You see, they didn't just believe it, they acted on it. They empowered women in a culture that didn't even allow women to be educated. They made women leaders because that's what they saw Jesus do. Because Jesus lifted the plight of women, they got behind that and they lifted the plight of women. They were against sex outside of marriage, which was completely foreign, especially to the Roman. They were absolutely and radically advocates for the poor. They even cared for the sick. In the Greek and the Roman cultures, especially, if they believed that if you got sick, that the gods were trying to get you, and so they didn't want to mess with you, so they would just either put you in a room or put you on the street. And again, the Christians would come, and they would minister to the sick. Completely countercultural. It's like, you, who are you people? They mixed the races and the classes together in their gatherings. And most notably, they believed that Christ was the only way to salvation. In a polytheistic, polygod kind of world, they said, you know, all those other, there's only one God, and Jesus is the way to salvation. They were completely countercultural, and yet they engaged the culture. Years ago, um, Back when, when you could actually visit hospitals, you know, when you could go visit people, um, I was sitting, sitting in the lobby because the person I was going to visit um, was having some extra things. Anyway, I was sitting in the lobby, and I was just sitting there watching what was going on, and um, over behind the desk, you know, the volunteer desk, some of you may be some of those folks that volunteer at that desk, there were about four, um, it was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and so you'll know what I'm about to say, they were church ladies. Everybody know what a church lady looks like? They were, they were the epitomal church ladies, four ladies sitting behind the desk, and um, a, a very, very well-dressed, probably um, a drug salesman type of person um, came walking through. She was high heels, business suit, came walking through. But just before she came walking through the lobby, a guy who had probably had like knee surgery, and if you've got a gag reflex, fair warning, I apologize. A guy who had probably just getting back up on his feet had walked through and somebody was helping him through on the walker and he lost his stomach, okay? And it ended up on the floor. Enough said, right? So there's this, this mess on the floor and, um, you know, they were very concerned about the, the, um, the patient, so they wheeled him on upstairs and everything, and the ladies were getting up to go and clean up the mess on the floor, and just as they did, that drug salesman came through, didn't see it, she's in her high heels, she put her foot in it, slipped, and fell into the mess, okay? And the church ladies, knowing what the mess was, knowing the whole story, knowing what was happening there and everything else, they ran to the mess, with towels to clean up this lady because she was caught in a mess. That's what it means to engage in strategic service. That's what it means to, to go into the mess with the solution, with the towels, with the cleanup. That's what it means for our ladies to go to the juvie jail every Monday with cookies, and with a loving smile, and with Bible, and go into that mess and say, your life has been messed up because you're in jail right now, but let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you of what God can do for you. That's what it means for us to, to get behind the We Care Homeless Ministry, to not go judging, to not go with our, with, with our high walls in place, but to go and say, let us show you, let us feed you, let us give you what God has given to us. Let us give you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Let us give you a, a good meal. We're not judging, but we're coming in Jesus' name. That's what it means for so many of our men and women to go across the street to Colonial Elementary and mentor children to step into the mess with the solution instead of avoiding it and not suffering. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from 
sinful desires which wage against your soul. I like the way D.A. Carson said it about the church. He said, Christ's followers are unalienated aliens. Unalienated aliens. In other words, we're, we're different. We don't fit in. There's no party. There's no situation. We don't fit in because we stand apart from the culture because we're a holy priesthood. But on the other hand, we engage the culture. We don't fit. And yet we're residents, but we're resident aliens. We're unalienated aliens. That's the tension. That's the tension that we all live in because the world wants to put us in one camp or another. And yet, as biblical Christians, we are called to engage the mess. That's the tension. But there's a paradox as well. There's a paradox that, that this passage pulls out. Look what he says. The world will reject you and recognize you. The world will reject you and recognize you at the same time. Look what he says. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. They're going to reject us on one side. They're going to vilify us on one side. And on the other side, they're going to go, great job. Thank you so much. That's good stuff. What he's talking about there is, is, a, is a concept called common grace. Okay? Common grace, there's, there's special grace, and that's what Christ has shown to us if we're his child. But there's common grace because every, every human is made in the image of God. Every human has, has enough God inside of us. God has made himself known through his creation so that no one is without excuse. Every one of us has a moral compass. And so let, let me just throw it out this way. Um, Dwayne's son has just returned from a tour in Iraq. Thank, you. Thank your son for his service and all the others as well. Thank you for that. But in Iraq, if you were to stand up, looking back at those eight points that we had, if you were to stand up and preach a message in Iraq, in secular sectarian Iraq, and you preached on the sanctity of marriage, the, the, the sanctity of sex within marriage, and the role of man and woman and all of those kind of things that just resonate with that sectarian society. I, I don't know if they do that over there, but I bet you'd get some amens. You know, I bet you'd be like, yeah, preacher, brother. If, I, I don't know what they would say, and it'd probably be something in Arabic. I don't know. But anyway, if you were to teach that, they would go, absolutely, I love that. That's great. Bring it on. That's, that's what we want to hear. But then if you were to finish that message with forgive your enemy, Turn the other cheek. When someone harms you, bless them. They would say, what are you talking about? We live in, a, in an eye for an eye culture. We live in a, in a society that says, if you've been wronged, you get revenge. And so they would bless us on one side and, and revile us on the other. On, but take that same sermon and take it to New York City or take it to any other Western culture. And if you were to begin that sermon with sex is between a man and a woman in the bounds of marriage, God made man and God made woman. They would say, how regressive. They would shut you out completely because they would say, you're so far behind the times. And yet, if you finished it the same way and say, when, you're, when, when someone wrongs you, turn the other cheek, forgive, forgive 70 times 7, they would go, oh, that's awesome. That's so beautiful. That's so loving. Amen, brother. You see, the same message can be received very, very differently depending on the foundation, the fundamental, depending on how it is perceived. And so we, as those who are living in this tension, those of us who are unalienated aliens, we live in the paradox. We live in the paradox that says some days they'll vilify and some days they'll glorify. Jesus put it this way. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, in other words, if they become too mainstream, too perish-minded, if they lose, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it in, there, put it in on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How do we get there? How do we, how do we resolve that paradox? How do we live confidently in that tension? We're different as we serve. We're neither to assimilate and avoid suffering or to draw away and avoid suffering. How do we balance that? How do we live in that place? Well, that's the power. But it's not really the power, it's the person of strategic action. How do we get to that place? We come to him. We come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. What does it mean to come to him? What, what does it mean to, to be drawn to him? It means that we have to do several things. We have to admit that we already have a cornerstone. Admit that we already have a cornerstone. But to those who do not believe, it says, the stone the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone. You know, what he's saying there is, who are the builders? The builders are everybody. Everyone is building their life on something. Everyone has that cornerstone. And again, I like the way D.A. Carson, he says it. He says, when you, when you defend yourself against yourself, that's your cornerstone. When you say, well, everything else is bad, but at least I'm a good parent. We say, everything else is bad, but at least I'm a good provider. I've provided for my family. Everything else is bad, but at least I'm a good, fill it in. That's your cornerstone. And everyone is building on a cornerstone. And when that cornerstone is shaken, it shakes the very foundation of your life. How do we live in the tension? How do we live in the paradox? We build our life on the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. Jesus said it this way. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. And then all of these other things will be added to you as well. What's your cornerstone? Do you find that cornerstone precious? Now, do you who believe this stone is precious? C.S. Lewis tells it this way. He says, I I imagine if you've got an illness and the doctor comes to you and he says, you've got a terminal illness. You will die, but here's a remedy. But it's a very, very expensive remedy. You will have to sell everything that you own. You'll have to sell your house and live on the street, you'll, you'll, you'll have to sell your car and walk everywhere you go. You're going to have to liquidate everything in order to buy this. And you would say, well, of course I'll take it because what good's a house if I'm dead? What good's a car if I can't get anywhere because I'm dead? Of course you would do that. And, and C.S. Lewis says, that's how you must approach Jesus as the precious cornerstone. That precious, that everything else pales in comparison. How do we get to that point where he is that kind of cornerstone? We come to him as the rejected one. We come to him as the rejected one. He was the one, Philippians 2, I think Dwayne prayed it earlier today, he is the one that God gave the name above all other names. But as you look back in Philippians 2, it says he emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. He went to death, even death on the cross. Why would he do that? Why would he be rejected by his family and by his friends and even at the end by God himself, by the Father himself? Why would he do that? For you and for me. Because we were that precious to him. And when we see that, he becomes that precious to us. Is he precious to you today? Is he that precious to cornerstone because you see the cornerstone is the foundation and when you are connected to that foundation if it is firm and secure so will you be so will you be in the tension and in the paradox and in the name of Jesus and what's interesting is as a cornerstone, if that cornerstone is honored everything connected to that cornerstone is honored if that, if that cornerstone is beautiful. Everything connected to that cornerstone is beautiful. The house itself connected to that cornerstone is beautiful and precious and separate and everything that we want it to be. That's why in 2 Corinthians 5, he can say, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And so as we engage in strategic action, 
as we go to try to bring the love and the lavish grace and the fundamental truth and all of those things into our community, when we recognize that we are already beautiful, we cannot become any more beautiful, we are already loved, we cannot become any more loved, we are already saved, we cannot become any more saved, then we will run to the mess with the message of Jesus Christ. Tolkien put it this way. He says, who cares whether or not you got the acclaim of the serfs when you've got the love of the king? How do we get to that point? We model what Jesus Christ himself did for us. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. He didn't attack like a like a sectarian. He didn't attack and say, oh, it's them. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He didn't retreat. He didn't assimilate. He was an unalienated alien. So who can you serve today in Jesus' name? Who can you engage today in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we do live in attention, but it's not attention that you yourself have not experienced. It's not attention that you yourself have not overcome. In this world, we will have trouble, you tell us. We will have suffering. We will have trials, but take courage. You have overcome the world. And so, Father, we thank you and bless you and, and praise you that you have called us to be a holy nation, but you have called us to be resident aliens. Father, give us your strength, give us your power, give us your will, give us your spirit, and open our eyes to the opportunities to run into the mess. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you stand together and sing our closing hymn? Reminders, today at 3 o'clock, our first concert of the series, and if you would like to be involved in the, the um, tech team, I guess is what we'll call it, for our um, COVID shot help, see um, Kathy Orr afterward. Now receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask or think or imagine, to him be the glory in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen.